Soldiers of the Vietnamese People's Army stormed into Phnom Penh after two weeks of fierce fighting, and they entered the city, finding it empty. Not just empty of Khmer Rouge soldiers, but of everyone. The capital city of democratic Kampuchea, the whole city, all of its buildings and all of its streets, were deserted. Everyone had left, but where had they gone? The mass evacuation carried out by the Khmer Rouge had been known of around the world four years earlier, so this meant that Phnom Penh had been abandoned all this time. There were no people, there was no activity, and there was no traffic. The radical communist regime had banned cars. There were only a handful of working automobiles in the whole country. A few top officials may have used them. The Khmer Rouge cadre rode bicycles while the rest of the population, forced to work 18-hour days in wretched cooperatives, walked around on foot. The cars and trucks of the once prosperous and peaceful capital had been consigned as scrap, stacked in piles in the streets by the Khmer Rouge, lifeless and vacant like all the buildings in the city. When the survivors of the terror of the past four years returned to Phnom Penh, this was how they found their city. And the skeletal remains left behind were not just of cars. Far away in another part of the world, the Trades General Workers' Union in Great Britain called a general strike in protest against Prime Minister James Callaghan's freeze on wage increases. The TGWU had hundreds of trade unions under its influence in nearly all British industry and represented millions of workers all across the country who walked off the job. When the government refused to budge on its tight incomes control policy, Truck drivers and then public sector unions all called strike in the early weeks of January as a harsh winter set in. The whole economy ground to a halt. As one sector, such as the lorry drivers, called strike and demanding pay rises beyond the government's 5% threshold, it began a domino effect that one after another, hospital workers, train drivers and ambulance drivers, waste collectors and finally grave diggers all called strike and demanded pay rises. Transportation of goods became impossible in some parts of the country as some unions picketed the ports. The public was told to dump their waste in public parks and as a bitter winter storm swept across the country in late January, the once mighty British Empire was considering the possibility of having to dump the bodies of their deceased at sea. And so began the year 1979. Violent protests, strikes, and riots rocked Iran for nearly a year, and an army mutiny caused the rapid disintegration of the pro-Western Shah Reza Pahlavi's government in the early months of 1979. A plane circled over Tehran. What remained of the Shah's forces in the city had threatened to shoot the plane down if it attempted to land and after circling for hours, finally touched down without a shot being fired. The Shah's army had just gave up. The plane's passenger, the bearded cleric, returning from exile abroad, was welcomed by cheering crowds. His name was Rahola Khomeini, but he is known around the world simply as the Ayatollah, the spiritual leader of the Iranian Revolution. The disruption by all the chaos caused a collapse in oil production in Iran, which was not helped by the fact that Ayatollah Khomeini regarded oil as well as atomic energy and science in general as tools of the devil. The sudden drop in exports caused a drastic rise in the price of crude, which spiked in 1979, causing the American Carter administration to have to remove the price controls that had been imposed earlier in the decade during the first oil crisis. The jump in gas prices quickly followed, and drivers rushed to gas stations across the country fearing another gas shortage like in 1973. You could almost say that the fear of a shortage led to panic buying, which in turn caused the shortages. And some politicians actually suggested oil and gas rationing. Gas lines once again became a feature of British and American cities. People queued up for fuel as prices shot upwards into the summer. 
The warnings from conservationists and environmentalists that dwindling resources would one day run out was beginning to look like a reality. And the car industry, through shrieks and moans, was finally, so it seemed, beginning to change its product lines into smaller, more economical cars. Ford redesigned the Mustang to its smallest body size yet and was available with Ford's 2.3-liter four-cylinder engine for these cash-strapped times. Fiat brought out an all-new car, the Ritmo, whose styling shows the first attempt of trying to integrate a chubby plastic-covered crash bumper into the front end of the car. It looks awful, but it's a nice try. I mean, they, they tried. Anyway, Saab stunned the world with their 99 Turbo last year, but the Saab Turbo is still a new thing and finally elevated Saab beyond being just a seller of some weird egg-shaped economy cars and into a seller of mystique. American Motors introduced the all-new Spirit camback sedan and liftback, and it wasn't really new at all. This was based on the Gremlin body. Well, the camback was a Gremlin, except the rear side windows were enlarged and it had some square headlights, but everything else was pretty much the same. The biggest news in the car industry in 1979 was that there really wasn't much that was new at all. Models introduced years earlier, like the Pacer, the Civic, the Nova, the Pinto, were years out of date and already obsolete, but because of the fall in sales throughout the decade and general fall in economic activity, new models either weren't ready yet, or as in the case of struggling companies like AMC, British Leyland, and Chrysler Europe, they didn't have anything new to offer and would have to make do with dressing up old cars as new. This was definitely the case in Eastern Europe, where a long period of stagnation brought on by a lack of trade with the West, costly wars abroad like Vietnam and in Africa, an expensive arms race, and with an economic system strangled by bureaucracy and government controls and under the long shadow of Soviet influence, people living in the Eastern Bloc had to sign onto a waiting list to get a car. And what was on offer, like the Trabant 601, the Wartburg, the Škoda 110, and the Moskvich, were essentially the same cars they had been for years, based on designs that dated back to the 1950s, and they were very expensive. The only somewhat new car in the Eastern Bloc was the FSO Polonaise, which was built in a factory in Warsaw, and it was heavily based on a Fiat 125, so it wasn't really new. So you may be asking, what cars were people buying in 1979? If they weren't interested in Chrysler's horribly built R body and weren't fooled by AMC's Spirit sedan, which was really just a 10-year-old gremlin with a new name, and if they didn't want a Buick Riviera or an Oldsmobile Cutlass liftback, and I don't know why they wouldn't, I wonder, I wonder. In between all the energy crises, the strikes, and the general economic collapse going on, people were buying imports in huge numbers. Japanese imports had been invading Western markets for years now, eating up more and more market share as domestic automakers struggled. Japan was already, by the start of the decade, a net exporter of cars. Don't think it was just about the price, either. That AMC Gremlin and the Ford Pinto that I just mentioned earlier those cars actually undercut the imports on price for most of those years. But the difference was that if you bought a Toyota and drove it around for six or seven years, it would still be running and it wouldn't incinerate its passengers in a minor rear end collision. Things didn't just start breaking days after the warranty expired. And if something did, you had a fair chance of getting it fixed for free anyway, because the Japanese automakers, particularly Toyota, prided themselves on excellent customer service, which was something that American automakers couldn't be arsed to bother with in 1979. Ford decided they'd rather take their chances in court rather than pay $11 per vehicle to fix the problems with the Pinto. During its many fire sales at the beginning of each year, Chrysler would sell you a, quote, new car that had been sitting in a muddy lot with flat tires for months, and General Motors advertised rust-proofing on its cars, which then began to rust a little more than a year after you purchased them. And the Japanese cars also offered something which was hugely important during the gas crisis, and that was excellent fuel economy. That Datsun Cherry I showed earlier, that car got 47 miles per gallon. 
What can compete with that? A downsized Buick Riviera with a 5.7 liter V8? So the only way forward for most automakers now was to try and design cars that could compete with the imports as best as they could. But for some, it was already too late. American Motors began a joint venture with Renault in 1978, which would in a few years lead to a full takeover of AMC by Renault. Chrysler signed away all of its European holdings, as we know, and left Europe altogether in 1979. A move which resulted in the loss of nearly 25% of its global market share. But this still wasn't enough, as Chrysler was broke and had to go to Washington, D.C. to ask for a bailout. When the Senate hearings began to go badly, Chrysler President John Ricardo suddenly resigned, leaving the new CEO, Lee Iacocca, to try and convince the politicians. British Leyland was fully under government administration in 1979, and it was practically a government jobs program at this point. It wasn't making any money, and because of all the strikes, could not even deliver on the cars people had actually placed orders for. This was especially tragic with the Rover 3500, which was being built in a brand new plant in Solihull, which had opened uh, just a couple of years ago, but they couldn't keep up with orders because of all the strikes. Leyland's new president, Michael Edwards, tried to crack down on this rampant anarchy and ordered the closure of the Triumph factory in Speak, one of the most notorious union bosses at Leyland, Derek Robinson, known as Red Robbo, was finally fired from BL in 1979. So I want to speak to you first tonight about a subject even more serious than energy or inflation. I want to talk to you right now about a fundamental threat to American democracy. The threat is nearly invisible in ordinary ways. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. A malaise was falling over America, a depressing gloom that only we can pull ourselves out of. The high unemployment, economic stagnation, yet high inflation, prices of everything went up along with auto and heating fuel, and all of this cemented into our collective consciousness with President Carter gloomily lamenting the malaise that had somehow gotten hold of us imploring Americans to use less heating fuel by installing wood-burning stoves and perhaps wearing a cardigan instead of turning up the heat and conserving energy as much as they could. And the energy crisis we faced would get much, much worse. In March, the nuclear power station at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania had a malfunction in reactor number two, causing a major meltdown inside the reactor as operators misunderstood warnings and the control room's computers proved to not be entirely reliable in identifying the problem. The atomic age had promised to bring virtually free and clean energy to the entire world, now ended with the miserable attempts by the power station's operators and scientists trying to convince the public there was really nothing to worry about during the visit by a concerned President Carter. As people fled the area, an explosion was prevented inside the beleaguered reactor only by venting radioactive gases to atmosphere. Even our technology had failed us. Okay, so here we are. It's a new year, and to look at some of the new cars coming out this year, we have this lovely automobile review catalog for 1979. Which, uh, which I have, we can, it's full of all kinds of, uh, of lovely pictures and, oh, what's happened? The power went out. Oh crap, it's the second time this week. Oh, okay, I'm gonna have to get a candle. Get to... Ow! Okay, well, I'm gonna have to find a place to, to show it to you 
in, in candlelight, I don't have, uh, I don't have any light. The power's gone out. Uh, I, I just asked a neighbor and I found out that what's actually happened is that the, uh, the electrical workers union has called a strike in response to the government's refusal to give them more than a 5% raise this year, which has led to all the rest of the utilities going on strike. And unfortunately, they can't bring in a backup crew because the taxi drivers are also on strike. So there's a lot going on right now. So here it is. And I'm shivering and cold because the, uh, the power has been out now for a, a couple of hours, and the, uh, the, the council has turned the heat down in the buildings for the past couple of months because of the high price of heating oil. So it's been very difficult to stay warm. So I'm, I'm having to wear a sweater all the time, as you can imagine. But anyway, here's the catalog. And if we look inside here, We'll see some of the new cars that are coming out this year, including this right here that I'm very excited about, which is the new Chevrolet Citation that is being introduced mid-year. It isn't out yet, so this looks like a sneak photograph. But hopefully that will introduce a new economical family car that can help GM beat the imports and then we have the new, the new Citron Visa, which is based on the Peugeot 104 that also came out this year. And like I was saying earlier, you have some new cars from American Motors, which is the new Spirit Sedan. Well, it's basically just a Gremlin, but Chrysler New Yorker, and that's the Fern's R body that was introduced in 1978 and unfortunately nobody wanted to buy the new Mustang there on the left and Chrysler is being really smart and they're introducing a variant of the Horizon which is this hatchback here the Plymouth Horizon TCS and that's that's that car right there if I can get it close to the candlelight and there's all kinds of amazing stuff in here. Here's the Honda Civic. And the Civic has taken the world by storm when it was introduced in 1975, but it's still largely the same as it was the past several years. Oldsmobile has introduced a brand new model this year, which is this new Cutlass Salon. And it's a, it's a lift back, the, cut, the Cutlass Salon lift back right there. And uh, I wouldn't have one. No, I don't, I don't much like that. Then, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff in here, like the Trabant entry from East Germany. And it's still pretty much the same car that it's been since the 1960s. Yeah, the AMC Pacer, they're still offering a V8 this year because they responded to the customer's demands for, you know, the car to have, you know, better acceleration and more power. And instead of making it lighter, they decided that what it really needed was a V8 engine. Which made it a lot heavier. And, and that's about it. So, yeah, but, you know, lots of really cool cars here from uh, from AMC. There's the new the new Spirit sedan and the uh, spirit lift back, the girl coming out of the, the sunroof there. And I don't know why I'm whispering, but, uh, and then there's the uh, Buick Skyhawk. that looks really terrible. But, um, and then you have good old British Leyland here with the, uh, with the Allegro. So yeah, lots of, really cool stuff uh, in, in this book. I do recommend getting it if you can find yourself a copy. It shouldn't be too expensive, but you know, we're living in a time of uh, high prices and lots of shortages. So, you know, be, be careful out there. 
The stunted size of the cars, the clumsy styling, outdated technology, the terrible quality, wimpy detuned engines, and desperate efforts to comply with government-regulated fuel economy reflected the loss of confidence that everyone was feeling the world over. Maybe this is why it's come to be known as the malaise era. In some ways, what happened in the auto industry was really a larger metaphor for society as a whole. The cars we built symbolized the problems we were going through, a metaphor of failure. It has been a decade of war, shortages, economic difficulties, political crises, and social upheaval. Maybe this is why most everyone was glad when it was finally over. Well, I hope this strike ends soon. It's been a few hours since the power's been on and it's getting really cold and it's raining right now. But I, I've heard that we're gonna have an election in a couple of months and hopefully we'll have a new prime minister who can maybe put an end to some of this nonsense and there'll be better days ahead. But as of right now, I don't know. But I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, put a like and maybe share it with some of your friends. And then I will see you soon in another video. Uh, be well and take care. Bye. If our people feel that they are part of a great nation and they're prepared to will the means to keep it great, then a great nation we shall be and shall remain. What then stands in our way? The prospect of another winter of discontent? I suppose it might. But I prefer to believe that certain lessons have been learned from experience. That we're coming slowly, painfully, to an autumn of understanding. And I hope it will be followed by a winter of common sense. Yeah.